great music this morning, Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. While you're turning, I will uh, amend the announcement that's made. We, we didn't have a, a little pipe to burst. It was a big burst. And uh, it was not a little water. There was over 100 gallons of water back here when they finally got the equipment here, started pumping water out of here. I'd babysat that pipe all day long trying to, to make sure I was keeping an eye on it. It had frozen. Uh, and, of course, I was watching it and it uh, was away from it for just a couple of hours, and that's when it uh, broke in a place I was not expecting it to. And uh, it broke right over the fire alarm panel back there. So the, the fire alarm was going off, and we were trying to get things moved out, and the, the company thankfully came in a, in a big hurry. But as we were taking the water out in the container, it was freezing up as quick as it hit the concrete out there. We're just not accustomed to this kind of cold weather down here, but I'm glad that that uh, we had some folks help us come move things along. And, of course, it's just one of those things that happens in the cold weather. They'll be here completing, of course, their work to get everything cleaned up. Uh, we got it pretty much dry enough to get in and out of the building. And thankfully, we didn't have to turn the water off for the whole building. It was just out of a hot water tank that's up there. So we're thankful for that. And uh, thank you for your patience because, of course, yesterday was Christmas Eve and we had a family gathering. We had family over last night. Uh, I gave Sharon the night off and didn't print a bulletin today. Uh, we typically do that on Saturday and Saturday evening. And uh, we decided, well, we would just take a little time off. So if you really want a bulletin, come back next week. We'll have one next week. But I appreciate Sharon. She uh, prints and uh, folds the bulletin every Sunday for us to be able to keep the news. And I know everybody likes the bulletin. You grab it up in your hand. And we need you to keep up with things in the bulletin. Uh, throughout the year. So we'll have a bulletin next week. We'll probably have the link for the uh, Bible app in the bulletin next week and that announcement as well. We'll have full services next week. I know it's New Year's Day, but I can't think of a better way to start the new year than, of course, being in church and Sunday school on Sunday morning. Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Would you stand as the scriptures read, please? I'm going to read an old familiar story. This story uh, evokes a lot of fond childhood memories. This is a story and a passage of scripture that uh, I remember from my earliest days of childhood. And for this morning, just because it's so familiar, I want to read out of the old King James Version today. Luke chapter 2, verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was, while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior which is Christ the Lord. This shall be a sign unto you that you shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill toward men. And it came to pass that the angels were gone away from them into heaven. The shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. They came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. Let's pray together, please. Father, we thank you for Christmas. We thank you for the gift 
of Jesus Christ, the gift of eternal life. I thank you for all that have taken the time to be at church on Christmas morning. We ask that as we look into your word, you would give us the unmistakable truth of your message of love and hope and peace, even in the worst of times. We ask that we would realize this, that each one here would have a personal knowledge of you in their heart. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. As I mentioned before, these are some very familiar words, familiar to all of us, of course, that grew up in church. And I remember even in public school, the uh, Christmas story was read uh, on the day before we left for Christmas. In this old story, not only is it a familiar passage of scripture with a lot of familiar characters that we've seen in I don't know how many Christmas plays, there's something else familiar in this passage of scripture. Unfortunately, there are some frustrations and some challenges that we see that Mary and Joseph faced that many times we face. And it's important to see how they face these challenges, these frustrations, because we face the same ones. If we're not facing them now, we'll face one of them later. First of all, as we look at the 2,000-year-old frustrations that are familiar to us today, political unrest. Luke starts out, it came to pass in those days that went a decree from Caesar Augustus. Now, as we look at this, you have to do a little bit of homework and realize the historical situation. There was a lot of political unrest with these two words, Caesar Augustus. Now, that made everybody uneasy. Caesar Augustus had come to power about 27 years before, had come to total power of what would be known as the Roman Empire. Through the years, he had consolidated his power. Through the years, he had obtained more military control. He had obtained more political power and authority, and he had widened his scope of authority over a broad footprint And the Roman Empire just did not involve Rome or Italy. It was encroaching on just about all the inhabited world at the time. That included the nation of Israel. And that made people uneasy. I know in that day they didn't have the 24-hour news cycle of CNN and Fox News that keeps everybody a little bit on edge and political unrest. Let me tell you what they did know. They did know that as they traveled, there were more and more Roman military outposts. They saw more and more Roman soldiers in their town, in their streets. They knew that while Caesar Augustus may be in Rome, he appointed some of his political cronies to be the governors and the regional rulers, one of them being Herod, and Herod was a mean man. Herod was an awful man, and we'll meet up with him later on in the Christmas story, won't we? And as all these people begin to be appointed, people begin to be nervous. People were suspicious of government. Does that sound familiar? People lost confidence in the people that were ruling them. Does that sound familiar? So we think of political unrest and upheaval and all the things that are going on in our country as something that's kind of new to America? Absolutely not. The whole country of Israel was in turmoil, political turmoil, because of these words, Caesar Augustus. They also faced financial uncertainty. Look at the statement. There went out a decree from Caesar Augustus. Now, what was the decree? That all the world would be taxed. Now, there's an idea. Let's just tax the whole world. That sounds very familiar, doesn't it? Sounds like Congress in the United States of America. Is there anything we've left untaxed? Let's tax that. So everybody was having to deal with taxes on top of taxes on top of taxes, and they were financially uncertain. They didn't know when the next tax was coming. This was officially a census, but the census was for purposes of taxing them and 
drafting them into Roman military service. Now, at that time, the Jewish people were exempt from Roman military service, but, oh, they weren't exempt from the taxes. So this census meant that everybody was going to be on the tax rolls. They knew where you were. They knew who you were. And they could come and levy their taxes. Interrupted plans. Because of the decree, they had to make a trip to Bethlehem. Because this decree said you had to go to the place of your lineage, not the place where you lived. Joseph, being of the house of David, had to make the trip to Bethlehem. It was not on the agenda. The trip to Bethlehem took three days. Three days either on the back of a pack animal or walking. Either way, Mary was in no condition to travel. Three days at the worst possible time, their plans were interrupted with this decree from Caesar Augustus. That's a familiar frustration. You ever got the call? Somebody's on the way to the emergency room? Drop everything. On your way to the emergency room. Accidents, car accidents, house fires, the death of somebody we love. Just like that, every plan you made for the day, every plan you made for the week, all changed. Your whole life is now an upheaval. I'm sure that wasn't on their agenda when they planned for the birth of this newborn baby. But now their plans were just interrupted. Everything looked like it was out of control. And then, unexpected hardship. As if things couldn't get any worse, they did once they got to Bethlehem because everybody else got the same decree. Bethlehem was a crowded place. And now there was nowhere to stay. And they couldn't stay in the big common area of the inn where everybody else stayed. They could only stay on the fringes where everybody kept their animals. But you stayed in that area because it was a lot safer if you stayed where the other people were. So they stayed in the fringe areas where everybody kept their animals. And that's, of course, when they were in the manger or the outskirts of the inn. See, sometimes we face unexpected hardship on top of everything else. And it looked like everything in their life was coming unraveled. You've been there. We've been there. Everything's come and unraveled. But when things are totally out of our control, things are still completely in God's control. Let's look at the event that began the whole avalanche of trouble for Joseph and Mary. And that was the decree of Caesar Augustus. That, that triggered all these frustrations. You see, when Caesar Augustus made the decree that the whole world should be taxed, that looks like, well, it, he's definitely in charge. When one man can make a decree that involves the whole world, it looks like if we're going to point to somebody that's in control, it has got to be Caesar. There could be nobody else that could be con in control. But the decree and its timing and its extent was all under God's complete control. How complete was God's control? Well, when did it cross Caesar's mind to initiate this tax, this census? We don't know. We don't know. We know it's definitely after he came to power. When did it cross his mind? You might think that that's the first time this thing ever had come into play. But before it ever crossed his mind, God was in complete control of the things that would happen when he made this decree. When did Caesar come to power? Caesar Augustus began his rise to power 44 years earlier when Julius Caesar was assassinated. Caesar Augustus was named Octavian at that time. Octavian was the great nephew of Julius Caesar. However, Julius Caesar had adopted little Octavian. And when Julius Caesar was assassinated by Brutus and his gang, 
That meant Octavian could come into power of Julius Caesar's post. Julius Caesar was only the ruler of the Roman Republic at that time. When Octavian took power, somebody else was in play for the whole domination. His name was Mark Antony. You remember Mark Antony? He had a girlfriend named Cleopatra. You remember all of that. Well, his forces and his political entourage defeated Mark Antony's entourage, and Mark Antony and Cleopatra committed suicide. Therefore, all of the different factions in Rome became consolidated under the ruler of, rulership of Octavian. Octavian, of course, changed his name to Caesar. The word Augustus, I believe, means the divine one or the revered one, just as long as anybody wouldn't mistake who he was and what he thought of himself. So he comes to power, and his power is finally consolidated in the year 27 B.C. And if you'll look in your history books, the year 27 B.C. is the beginning point of the Roman Empire. When he came to power, he had a worldwide empire. 27 years before his decree. But you see, God was in complete control before the Roman Empire. God was in complete control before Julius Caesar. How far back did God's control go over what happened when he gave the decree? Well, we find that in Micah chapter 5, verse 2. Micah chapter 5, verse 2. <clears throat> Micah chapter 5, verse 2. Micah's kind of hard to find. It's just a couple of pages long. You found it yet? Hadn't found it yet. But he's found it. He's looking for it. All right. I like complete honesty. Make sure you find that. Micah chapter 5, verse 2. But thou Bethlehem, Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth that is to be ruler in Israel. Listen to this. Whose going forth has been from old, from everlasting. We know by then what ruler he was talking about. He was talking about the Messiah. He was talking about the Son of God. He was talking about the promised Savior. And he said, where would this Savior be born? In Bethlehem. Where did Mary and Joseph live? In Nazareth. How were they going to get Mary and Joseph from Nazareth to Bethlehem at just the right time for the Savior to fulfill a 700-year-old prophecy? It came to pass in those days they went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world would be taxed. Caesar thought he was in charge. The decree, its extent, and its timing all perfectly lined up with God's complete control. Caesar wasn't in control. God was in control 700 years before. So you want to talk about complete control? Empires had come and gone. And Rome was just another one. And God was still calling the shots for 700 plus years. Joseph and Mary's calm resilience can be as familiar to us as their frustrations are to us. And those frustrations are familiar. But maybe their calm assurance isn't familiar. You see, we often picture Joseph and Mary being as frustrated as we are. Oh, look at poor Mary having to go all the way to Bethlehem. Can you imagine what she said when Joseph came home and said, okay, Mary, pack up. We've got to go to Bethlehem. And she said, you've got to be kidding. We're not going to Bethlehem. Look at what kind of situation I'm in. We've got to go. I don't know where we're going to do. This is all awful. My whole life is, the whole world's coming to the end. And we look at them as maybe facing these things just like we do. But look closer at the scriptures 
And you see that they undoubtedly have some calm resilience. You see, both of them knew who this baby was. Both of them. Mary was told. Joseph was told. It wasn't just another birth. Both of them knew of the importance of this. And both of them being Jewish young people knew of Micah's prophecy. Both of them had to know it. We're not the first ones to discover this prophecy, are we? It was written 700 years before then. They were familiar with the prophets. They knew where the Messiah would be born, and they were told this was the Messiah. Now, undoubtedly, they stayed in Nazareth, but the decree came, and they had to make the three-day trip. Do you think it took them by surprise? They were told by God who this was. And both of them, here's the secret of their resilience. Both of them fully surrendered to the will of God, trusting the word of God. Now, where do, where do we find that? You remember? We'll just start back in Matthew. Joseph. Joseph was troubled. Joseph was troubled because things didn't look real good. It looked like his, his, his beloved, little, sweet, cherished, betrothed, engaged wife-to-be had been unfaithful. And Joseph was alerted by an angel in a dream, said, don't be afraid to take Mary to be your wife. He said, that is which is conceived in her is the Son of God. And this is, to be full, this is a fulfillment of the prophecy that you know very well. It's in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. This will be a sign to you. A virgin will conceive and bear a son, and you'll call his name Jesus. Emmanuel, God with us. He believed that. How do we know that? It says, and Joseph got up the next morning, and listen to this, and did exactly what God commanded. I believe that's in Matthew chapter 1, verse 24. Exactly what God commanded. You know, why did he do exactly what God commanded? Because he believed the word of God. And because he believed the word of God and he was doing what God had instructed him to do, no doubt that even when it looked like things were coming unraveled, there was a calm assurance because he believed the word of God and he knew he was following God's instructions. Then there's Mary. Mary not only obeyed the word of God, but she made a statement. You see this statement in Luke chapter 1, verse 38. And Mary said, of course, this is talking to the messenger of God. He brings to her the message of God, but she says, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to your word. Let happen to me, whatever happens, let it happen according to your word. What was she talking about? Well, she could be talking about two things. Talking about two things because the first thing was, of course, the instructions from Gabriel. The immediate message that she had gotten of exactly what was going to happen. And she had given birth to this, this God-man. But then again, what word? Your word. Whatever happens to me, let it be according to your word. What did his word say? His word said that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Regardless of how they got there and what they'd have to go through to get there, she knew, according to God's word, Bethlehem was the place to be at that time, no matter how inconvenient. Wow. Isn't that something? She was surrendered to the word of God, no matter how much inconvenience it may have caused her. How much inconvenience does it take for us to abandon what God's word says about our life? Like Joseph and Mary, 
When we believe the word of God to the point where we are completely surrendered to his will, there will be a calm assurance that could saturate our lives even in the midst of the worst of frustrations, interrupted plans, and unexpected hardships. That's the Christmas message. As we prepare for an invitation on him, what's going on in your life? <clears throat> you recognize one of these frustrations? Which one's going on now? Maybe all of them. Do you know that calm assurance? Jesus Christ came to be born, to live a sinless life, to live with us, and then to pay the price for our sins. So none of these things, none of these things, can overwhelm us, but we can always face the challenges of life with calm assurance because of that Christmas gift of Jesus Christ. As we stand and sing. Number six, page six.